Good afternoon. I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. Special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. A reminder as well that you can watch TVJ Live by downloading our OneSpot Media app in the Google Play Store or the App Store. That's the number one, followed by the words Spot and Media. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck is exploring options that could see persons who plead guilty getting early leave from prison or serving their time in low-risk facilities. The government is considering changes to the Parole Act as well as policy changes in the Department of Correctional Services. These changes will complement the new plea bargaining legislation. Speaking on RGR's Balancing Justice last night, Mr. Chuck said there are more than 2,000 cases to be tried in the circuit courts for this term, but it will not be possible. He says the proposed changes will help to ease the backlog in the court system. Because a person who accepts and admits to wrongdoing and is willing to plead guilty then that person should be given further assistance if possible so that in the prison system, if, a, if this is a prison term that has to be served, I would ask the, the prison authorities to look, consider them favorably, not entitled enough, but eligible to serve their sentence in, say, the low-risk prison like Tamar and Farm or Richmond Farm. And moreover, persons who plead guilty when they come up for consideration for parole that the fact that they pleaded guilty, engaged in rehabilitation programs in a prison, should be given a favorable consideration for early parole. And plea bargaining legislation should become law in Jamaica within the next two weeks. It allows accused persons to get lighter sentences if they plead guilty to a crime. Mr. Chuck says that only administrative processes remain at this time. Most of these amendments were not substantive issues. A lot of it were stylistic. And we asked my, I asked my staff and the Attorney General's chambers to try to get it to the printing office, the changes, so that I can take it to the House. And yes. at about 4.30, 5 o'clock, I took it to the House. So it is now basically law to be signed off by the Governor General, hopefully within the next week or so. Taxpayers will be footing a $106 billion bill as the government will be writing off debt and receivables in relation to the Financial Services Institution Limited FIS and the financial adjustment company FinSAC. Both entities which took over the operations of several financial entities in the 1990s by acquiring shares and loans have been trying to dispose of those interests by selling to local and international purchasers. At this morning's post-cabinet press briefing, Information Minister Senator Ruel Reed said the entities are to end operations within the next 18 months. As a result of this, um, in order to facilitate the winding up process, various debt due from intervened entities will have to be written off. And this will aid in facilitating an application to the company's office of Jamaica to remove FINSAC and FIS from the register and to, of companies and, of course, to liquidate them. He says the government has done everything possible to recover the outstanding debts and so from an accounting standpoint, the write-off is the only option. He says the completed FINSAC report providing details of transactions will be tabled in Parliament by the end of the year. Despite ongoing expressions of disgruntlement from the Trinidad and Tobago's Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, the Jamaican government says it is yet to receive a letter from that country regarding last week's incident where a government minister from the Twin Island Republic was searched. Ayana Webster Roy was searched on Friday at the Norman Manley International Airport while preparing to board a flight. 
The Trinidad and Tobago Foreign Affairs Minister Dennis Moses yesterday said he had written to Jamaica's Foreign Affairs Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith complaining in a forceful manner about the incident. But Mr. Reid says after a regular dialogue with Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith this morning, the government has only heard about the letter of complaint via the media. Our own um, access to communication, there has been no letter received by her or the government of Jamaica from any official or government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. So we are aware um, that there are these concerns. We are waiting such a letter if there is such. And at the moment, the release through the office of the Prime Minister that the Minister has provided is the position of this administration. And again, we regret the unfortunate incident. In a release on Sunday, Jamaica's Foreign Affairs Minister said the search was conducted by a private security company retained by the airline on which the minister and her delegation were traveling. The over 40,000 depositors that were part of the failed Cash Plus entity will have a lengthy wait before they receive a payout. This was disclosed in a statement from the Office of the Trustee in Bankruptcy this morning. Trustee value of claims made by 21,000 persons is in excess of the $19 billion that was set aside to pay depositors. 35,000 claims were received. The office says when receivership began, Cash Plus had liabilities of $23 billion, $19 billion of which was due to depositors. To date, the trustee says $827.5 million Jamaican dollars and $1.16 million U.S. dollars have been recovered. The funds came mainly from the sale of properties, rental of real estate, and payments owed to the Cash Plus Group from transactions prior to the receivership and liquidation. The trustee states that the official value of the asset portfolio of the Cash Plus Group to date is insufficient to make a payment on claims. Herman Green, TVJ News. More persons are under investigation after 1,800 taxpayers were brought to book over abuse of the income tax threshold. The audit resulted in the taxpayers who underreported their income being assessed to pay more than $167 million in income tax. Chief Corporate Communications Officer at Tax Administration Jamaica, Marys Houghton, told our news center that the clampdown is far from over. We have other persons on the radar. It's a program that started in January of this year, and we'll be continuing that during this fiscal year, given the success we have had thus far, as we're using our Revenue Administration information system to unearth this, this practice where persons have been abusing the threshold and having the benefit of the threshold more than once because they have multiple employment. And Ms. Houghton outlined how persons with more than one job have benefited from the income tax threshold. That they're only entitled to one income tax threshold for the year. And anything outside of that, if they have multiple employment, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with having multiple employment. However, they are asked to file their returns, which would reflect that they have more than one employment and pay whatever taxes are due. A mother and son are among four persons who were fatally shot in Barrett Town and Barrett Hall, St. James, early this morning. According to reports, three of the persons were shot in Barrett Town. The gunmen went to the neighboring Barrett Hall where they continued with their shooting spree. Details from Simone Golding. Invaded the community of Barrett Town in St. James early this morning, leaving three members of a family dead. They have been identified as 59-year-old Doreen Brown, her son Wade Wheatley and Carlton Daly. One person is in hospital, a 15-year-old who is in critical condition. Joycelyn Brown is Doreen's sister. She cannot understand why someone would want to kill her sister and her son. When I get the news in at 2.30 this morning, I hear that they killed my sister and his son. It shocked me because... Doreen no deserve it and Doreen don't trouble people. So I don't know what's happened. Make them come and kill his son and kill her. It's understood that the gunmen kicked open the door, then opened fire on the family. This woman who was in the house described how she escaped. Me and Doreen, we live on one bed. I come like I say, I called Tuffman to let me in. I was not Tuffman to let me in. I'll Dora say, 
What do you let him go now? Make him go and sleep and sit. Oh, God. Oh, I'm going to be a shot. Good thing me and me be a fire. Dar, dar. I'm going to hear no more. Go run. Go down a station. Run me and run. Councillor for the Rose Hall Division, Anthony Murray, says he wants the police to restrict the movement of residents in Barrett Town. I wouldn't mind having here a being curfew. We need to have a state of emergency for centuries. I am in support. I know that my fellow councillor Charles Sinclair had made that appeal, and I'm in full support of it. We need to get serious and get rough, I even act and get rough on this crime situation. Guys, get another fan. Get another fan. The gunmen then went to the neighboring community of Barrett Hall, where an unidentified woman was killed. Simone Golding reporting for TVJ News. Investigators and forensic experts will today return to a house in West and Negril, Westmoreland, where it is believed that a missing woman and her child were killed and buried. The Negril police say 24-year-old Chantal Dar and her daughter, 3-year-old three year old Orlando Miller, were reported missing on Monday. Ms. Dar's mother told the police that she has been calling her daughter's phone for several weeks, but there has been no answer. Checks were subsequently made at Ms. Dar's home and the makeshift grave was found. Speaking at the launch of a breakfast program in South Manchester recently, head of the Caribbean School of Nursing, Dr. Adela Campbell, says local statistics have shown that chronic non-communicable diseases, NCDs, are among the leading cause of death in Jamaica. In 2012, 5% of the population had had a diagnosis of diabetes and 11.6% had hypertension or, or high blood pressure. It is also true that these NCDs constitute a burden on the public health system and the Jamaican government currently spends over $170 million annually to manage these conditions. She added that the consumption of fats and sugars are major contributors to obesity in children, especially between the ages of 6 and 10 and 13 and 17 years. Therefore, providing a breakfast program to madly unnourished students will help to improve verbal fluency and speech. Studies have found that breakfast consumption can positively impact cognitive performance and the lack thereof may be associated with emotional, behavioral, and academic problems in children and adolescents. Additionally, breakfast consumption has been shown to improve memory. Generally, breakfast consumption is associated with good health and well-being in children. Dr. Campbell reiterated that breakfast programs in schools will help to positively impact the lives of children. And since it's a Wednesday, it's that time again where we take a look at what's coming up in this evening's health report. In the next edition of the health report, we look at flood waters which become stagnant. If you are splashing in freshly um, fallen rain, you know, that is a pastime for all kids. But standing water, um, stagnant water, water that is smelly or malodorous, I would recommend strongly that you stay away from these bodies of water. That's the health report this evening in primetime news. And now for today's healthy living tip. Don't allow children to play in flood waters. Wash your hands if you have come in contact with flood waters. Disinfect items that have touched flood waters. Never expose an open wound to flood waters. Use a waterproof bandage at all times. Don't eat foods that have come in contact with flood waters, even if they are packaged. In news overseas, U.S. President Donald Trump announced Wednesday that he plans to nominate Christopher A. Ray, the former Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Justice Department's Criminal Division, to be the next FBI Director. Trump's announcement comes one day before former FBI Director James Comey is set to testify in a bombshell hearing before the Senate. For the details, we join the CNN. President Trump announcing in a tweet that he has a new FBI director nearly a month after firing James Comey. Here's the tweet, it reads, I will be nominating Christopher A. Ray, a man of impeccable credentials to be the new director of the FBI, details to follow. Now, we must assume that despite what we've heard from the White House, this is an official statement from the president, and it will be his policy move to bring in the next director by this name. Ray 
is well known in government ranks. He was involved with the Department of Justice as an assistant attorney general from 2003 to 2005. He headed the criminal division there for President George W. Bush. Uh, he was in the Georgia field office before that since 1997. He is a very respected white collar litigator. He was Governor Chris Christie's personal attorney during the Bridgegate situation. He went to Yale Law School, Allison. He is a well-regarded man. He does have uh, a pretty interesting and deep government history, but the scrutiny is now just about to begin. A little bit of controversy there that the president is bringing in someone from outside the agency. And in sports, two Canadians, Phil Jones and Dave Leblond, will square off as the, for the second semifinal spot in the Reigned Nephew Contender Series at the headquarters of the Chinese Benevolent Association. With Canada having five of eight contender quarterfinalists, an all-Canadian clash was possible. But it's the first time in four years since Jamaica started taking on an overseas team that foreigners are squaring off for a semifinal spot. 34-year-old Phil Jones, who scored a split decision win over Ricardo Planta, now squares off against Dave LeBlanc, who takes the ring for a third time in the contender series so far. My approach is he throws three, I, I throw five, right? So and uh, there's not going to be any unanswered punches. Um, every punch is going to count and uh, make smart decisions. LeBlanc rebounded from defeat to Tetsilite South Davis with a difficult majority decision win over Jamaica's Nico Yeo after fellow Canadian Ryan Wagner withdrew. His coach Patrice Trudeau is promising a better fight from LeBlanc. Uh, but as far as the game plan is concerned, use the speed and move around. So, uh, and again, we're facing a, a very big opponent. Uh, and the guy's fit, and the guy is ready to fight. He's, he's come here for serious business, and that's what we came here for as well. Jones, who is seeking his sixth win from 13 fights, enters the ring at 153 pounds. That's one pound heavier than LeBlanc. TVJ will have live coverage of the fight starting at 9.30. Reporting for TVJ Sports, I'm Keon Reyna. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.